Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I, of course, am your host, Chris Broussard, and boy, do we have another exciting show for you. We have Evan Daniels, the FS1 college basketball insider. He's going to break down everything from the NCAA tournament, including how the best individual prospects, DeAndre Ayton, Trey Young, so on and so forth, project as future NBA players or maybe even stars. Then, of course, we've got my man, Jason McIntyre, back for another fun episode of Knockdown J. But first, as always, we're going to hit you with a top five. Now, this week, Wednesday, March 14th to be exact, Steph Curry's 30th birthday. So in honor of Steph, I want to hit you with a top five things you need to know about the two-time MVP. Number five. Steph should have been the MVP of the 2015 NBA Finals, the first championship that the Golden State Warriors won in this era. Andre Iguodala got the MVP, did a great job. I know when Dre got moved into the starting lineup in game four, it changed the series and the Warriors won the next three games. But guess what? They weren't guarding Iguodala at the three-point line. Timothy Mozgov was standing under the basket. He was wide open. And for all the great things Iguodala did, he did them as a role player. I know he got, gave you 16 points, but Steph gave you 26 points on average in that series. People think Steph didn't play well. He averaged 26 points, six rebounds, and five assists a game. And we go to those three pivotal games. Remember, Cleveland was up 2-1. So the last three games were huge. In those three games, Steph Curry averaged 28 points on 49% shooting, including 45% from three-point land. Where is this myth, this narrative that he didn't play well come from? Number four, Steph Curry, admittedly, a bad defender. No defending him there. But he's not as bad as you think. He is ranked 70th in the NBA in defensive Real plus minus. That's one of those metrics now the analytics guys love, and it's legitimate. All right, 70th among point guards in defensive real plus minus. Not good, but guess what? Better than Rajon Rondo. Better than Kyrie Irving. Better than Matthew Della Vadova, who is known as a defender. And better than George Hill, who's also known as a good defender at the point guard. So again, he ain't locking nobody up. They hide him on defense. Other teams look to put him in pick and roll to get him switched on them so they can exploit him. But he's not as poor of a defender as his reputation says. All right, number three, Steph Curry. Inch for inch is one of the better rebounders in the league. I know that's shocking because he's viewed as a finesse player. He's viewed as soft and cuddly and all that. But he is one of only four players, 6'3 and under, averaging at least five rebounds a game. Think about that. Four players in the league averaging five or more rebounds, and Steph Curry is one of them. The other three? Russell Westbrook, Kyle Lowry, and Chris Paul. All three of them known as Bulldogs. Hardcore, tough players. You might have to put Steph in that category as a Bulldog. A hardcore, tough player. And that might be a little bit of an overstatement, but he's tougher than you think. Number two, Steph Curry is one of only four players in NBA history to average 30 points a game on fewer than 21 shots a game. That is incredible. Michael Jordan didn't do it. He was efficient. Kobe Bryant didn't do it. Shaquille O'Neal didn't do it. George Gervin didn't do it. Allen Iverson, I mean, all these great scores. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar didn't do it. But little old Steph Curry did it. The other three, Adrian Danley, gotta give love to him, great score. The other guy, Carl Malone, Second leading scorer of all times in terms of total points. The other guy, Kevin Durant. We know he's an all-time great scorer, one of the best handful of scorers we've ever seen. The number one thing you need to know about Steph Curry on his birthday 
He is the Warriors MVP, most valuable player. Yep, I said it. Kevin Durant, I will tell you this, I believe it in my heart, is the Warriors best player. Great defender now, obviously great offensively, but their most important, most valuable player is little old Steph Curry. And here's the proof. In the last two years, without Steph Curry, the Warriors are 13 and seven. That's a 53 win pace. Not bad, but not great. Without Kevin Durant the last two years, they are 25 and five. That's a 68 win pace. That's historic. Steph Curry, the way he spreads the floor, the way he stretches the defense with his shooting range, the way you can't get all up on him because he'll go by you with his handle, finish in the mid range, finish at the rim, is a great passer, and then is constantly moving without the basketball. He is their most important player. He is the system. He makes the system go. Steve Kerr told us that earlier in the year. And here's the thing, the Warriors, without Steph Curry, if his ankle problems persist, if God forbid he suffers an ankle injury in the playoffs that keeps him out, the Golden State Warriors, for all their greatness, for all their talent, will not win an NBA championship without Steph Curry. All right, back again for more trouble is my man Jason McIntyre. Another segment of Knockdown, Jay, really one of my favorite parts of the podcast. How you doing, man? I, I'm excellent. Jay. Coming off last week's victory and all the friendly comments I got on YouTube, is I'm ready for you. Is that what you call it? You, you won you. one of the three <laughs> segments. That's a victory. I guess that is a victory. That is improvement. All right, all right. What do you have for me this week? Just Why bring don't we it start on. with uh, your buddy, your best friend, LeBron James? Let's start there, shall we? I like LeBron. So, Great player. Uh, Cavs sputtering when they came out west, lost to the Clippers and Lakers, two lottery-bound teams by double figures. It was bad. Clippers are currently in the playoffs. They're going to be lottery-bound. We know really? that. Really? Yeah. Okay. And when you look at LeBron's offseason and he leaves the east to go to the west, you know, there's so much talk. Wait, wait. You're saying that's as a fact. I mean, nothing's a fact. We're okay. not in July yet. Just ask. But if LeBron does go west, I want to ask you about LeBron's to legacy. To the Lakers or the yeah. Rockets. Lakers, or Rockets, whomever. I, even if they don't get to the finals, I don't think it dings his legacy whatsoever, as opposed to staying in the east and getting to the finals and losing. I, I'm just so over this whole, well, his legacy is going to be damaged. Chris, he has established his legacy. He is in the discussion with Michael Jordan. True or false? Just a true or false? No, th his legacy is set as an all-time right. great as an player. All -time. In the same probably discussion the second, as Mike. Well, he's second best player okay. of all so time. So when your legacy... In most pe in, I think in most people's... Right. He's top five for most people. I and several others have him second right. best to Jordan. Okay. I think he'd have to do a ton right. to uh, surpass I Jordan. largely agree with but you. But that's pretty much settled. But that's my, my thing. If he goes west... Lakers, Rockets, they don't win a title. I don't think his legacy damage is damaged, and then he falls below Kobe or Kareem. No, or, I, I it, wouldn't that's say. Not possible. Well, may, who knows? You, you never know the way things play out. Could he fall below them? I don't know. I wouldn't think so. I will say this: when you go, let's say he goes to the Lakers, everybody else on his level, except Elgin Baylor, if you put Elgin Baylor on his level. Everybody else on his level who's played for the Lakers has delivered yes. a championship. Different eras, Jerry, but yes. No, J Era Smeros. Oh, Era doesn't matter. Jerry West, Wilt Chamberlain, Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Shaquille O'Neal, mm. Kobe Bryant, they all won championships. In L.A., no. getting to the second round means nothing. Right. Kobe was getting to the second round toward the end of his career, uh, and people were saying, well, Toward the, of, round, toward, the end of the, toward the end of the Phil Jackson era, they were still getting to the second round, and it was nothing. It was not good enough. It was down. I'm saying if LeBron comes here and they just get to the second round and they're out, does it mean he's not the second best player ever? Maybe not, but it it is a nick on his legacy oh, because it, because everybody else, the Lakers did they are expecting a championship. When you come and there. And they may get one. Now, they might, but let's say he goes to Houston. And you're with James Harden and Chris Paul, and they're great. And they're ring chasing. They're great. Yeah. If he goes and joins those two and still 
doesn't win a title or get to the finals. That, again, doesn't look good. I'm saying if you stay in the East and you play for Philadelphia or even you stay in Cleveland, if you get to the finals, a lot of people are saying better not to get to the finals than to get there and keep losing. I would disagree. You go as far as you can. Yeah. If LeBron goes three and eight in the finals, say he gets there three more times and loses, that is still a tremendous accomplishment. Three and eight, people would kill him, say he lost eight times, but that's 11 trips to the finals. Magic was, Johnson lost. And how many of them were straight? Uh, about 10 of them, well, right? So, no, so far it would seven. Be, it, would, it could be well, 10 it, if he stays in the He can just keep the string going, who knows? But it's seven right now. That's impressive. That's, that's my point. Look, only four teams in NBA history have even ever gotten to four straight finals. Teams. That's how hard it is. Right now, the Warriors are trying to do it. You see the mental exhaustion, the emotional exhaustion. For one player to do it seven Chris, straight he, times, is this, that is a great achievement. Is this not the same discussion as better to have loved and lost than to have never loved ever, right? That it's good Who is that, to, Shakespeare? I believe it's what Shakespeare. Is, uh, <laughs> I, someone think you on that Dan, I don't think you did it justice. It was, it was close. <laughs> so, I mean, listen, just getting to the finals is great. That's an amazing accomplishment. So and should, you why have, go wait, wait, wait. to the West then? Well, hold on. You just said uh, super team era Shmera. It doesn't matter, okay? Larry Bird, Magic Johnson, those were the two best teams in the league by far for a decade. Michael Jordan didn't have to face those super teams, okay? What the era that LeBron's in right now, he is facing arguably the best team of all time. These Golden State Warriors right now, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Klay Thompson, 12-1 and last year in the playoffs, okay? They're looking utterly dominant. I don't see how losing to an all-time great team is going to damage LeBron's legacy. He's no, already up here. I, I, it's not going to damage it. It, it, it would be, be a black mark on oh, his no, legacy. No, it's not. It, to can, get, to, you're still in your prime and you're going out in the second round. In June, if he's no longer a factor, name me the last player who was the face of the NBA who wasn't a factor in June. Uh, let's see. Face of the NBA, not a factor in June. Derek, you can't. Derek Rose? He was never the he, face of the NBA. He was the he MVP of the so league. What? Steve Nash wasn't the face of the MVP either. I'm going to give it to you. Since Dr. J was the first face okay. of the league in re modern history, uh, he was in the finals a lot yep. with the Sixers. Then it was Magic and Bird, obviously in the finals a lot. Then it was Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan. stayed in the finals. Shaq then it was Kobe. Shaq and Kobe in the finals. Well, wait, you said they got bounced in the second round. What? Did, didn't you say they got bounced in the second Who? round? Kobe. You said Kobe Bryant was bounced in the second round with the Lakers. Yeah. I said toward the end of his career oh, okay. with Phil Jackson. Shaq. Okay, uh, Phil, that's fair. Shaq and Kobe, they were in the finals. LeBron, when he got to the finals in 07, that's when he kind of became the face of the league. My point is, you need, the face of the league, it's been LeBron. Then it kind of became Steph. How many when, guys were the face of the league at Steph? 33 years old? That's what. That's All another. Right, that's go. another great thing for him. He's exactly. still the best player in the well, world in his I, 15th year. I would year say at Kevin Durant's the best player, but you know that we're splitting hairs again. I don't see how it's hurting him at all. Look, it's not going to take dominant. him out of the top five exactly. players of all time. So his but, legacy's not damaged. Still, are you playing to win? Okay. Yes, are you are. But you're also win? playing to be happy, Chris. On on some level, maybe he's not happy. You don't. With this you have no. Look, leave the happiness alone. What, what, why? Because we have no you idea what makes him happy. We have no idea what makes him happy. Exactly. Exactly. I, we I know what makes a basketball player happy. Winning. winning. Yes, we know that. But winning. There's more to life than basketball. Clearly for LeBron, he's in movies. He's going he's to be global. Young. He's a global brand. What are you talking about? What the, are you talking about? Global more. movies. We talking about basketball. Yes, Dude, don't bring movies, rap, commercials. I don't want to. Basketball. He can have everything he wants if he's not happy in Cleveland with the owner and his I teammates. Why you can bring that up? You have no idea oh, if he's happy in Cleveland. Don't bring up the happiness because we have no happiness idea. Happiness doesn't matter. What Win. Cities, okay. we have yeah. no. My point is, we have no idea what city's gonna make him happy. All we can judge it on is basketball. Yeah, basketball. So he might not be happy playing stuff. with Jordan Clarkson and Rodney Hood. We don't know. It's his prerogative. Exactly. My so point is, that has is to go to the Lakers and try to build back the Lakers' legacy up and restore that legacy brand. to the second round. Well, you're, why is he going out in the second round? We're talking about the Warriors, baby, being in jeopardy because of a Steph Curry injury. Okay, Steph Curry goes down next year. The Lakers going out in the second round. They're better they, than the Rockets. I, yeah, oh, the, stop it! They're better than the Rockets. Well, with with Lonzo the and Ingram and Kuzma and Paul George. The Rockets George. look phenomenal. Oh, what are you talking no about? Way. I'm saying what I'm saying. Oh, Chris Paul's is, gonna look phenomenal. Thirty four next year, is he? 
He's doing it right now. Okay. Yeah, right now is one thing. Is he going to do it next year? LeBron got the same age issue. Paul jo- LeBron's I never mean, had an injury around anybody. LeBron's never had an injury in his career. How many surgeries Chris Paul had on his knees? I don't know about surgery, All right, but he's there had we go. injuries. There we go. But my point, you you just going to sit here and say, oh, he's not going to play when well, he's Well, you're bouncing great. LeBron in the second no, round. That's unfair. All I'm saying is this. My point is this. It's better to continue to get to the finals than to go – to the West. And if he goes to the West and gets to the finals, great. I'm just saying it's better to get to the finals and lose uh, how about this? than to not get to the LeBron finals. That's goes, my argument. Okay, l- l- hypothetical since that's all we're dealing with. LeBron goes to the Lakers, they win the title. It's great. Then is he above Jordan? Are you putting him above no. Jordan? No. So he cannot get above Jordan and he can't you know, go below you know Jordan. What, would be what a, can he do, Chris? You know what would be a bigger achievement? If he wins the finals in Cleveland. Oh, he's already done that. Do it again. Oh, geez. Do it with these. Oh, yeah. And okay. again. Here, oh, we're going to now say stipulations on might, how LeBron can get better. He hey, might not. You be- need to win a title with George Hill. That's what will take you no, over the top. No. That's silly. No, what I'm saying, I'm not saying a title with the Lakers wouldn't be great. I'm saying if he can beat this Warriors team or that Rockets team with this Cleveland, if he can't, fine. Because that's be a tremendous accomplishment. That's a lot to ask. Yeah. But if you want to pass Michael Jordan, that's what I'm saying. Mm. Beating, beating those teams with Paul George and the Lakers would not be as big as beating, the, well, beating them with this Cleveland team. putting them out in the second round. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm saying that if they go to the West, there's a better chance he doesn't get to the finals oh than God. if he stays in the East. I have a total disagreement. Let's go to Neil as a scorecard. How is it a total? Uh, he wouldn't have a better chance I of getting. I don't get, think. Hold on. Staying in the East wouldn't give him a better chance of getting get to, to the, the finals. finals. But that does, his team's not going to beat the team from the West. Not with Joel Embiid and, Bill, and, and the Ben Simmons. They, they'd have no oh, shot. Yeah. So now you want to add the Philadelphia thing. Hey, no, go, fine. That's that's the, not, where's Philadelphia I mean, play? Again, in the what, East or the uh, West? Uh, Joel Embiid going to play back-to-backs next year? Do we know that? Is he healthy? Can Ben Simmons? healthy so far. Ben Simmons make an outside shot. See, I'm like, not, I don't I'm know. Maybe one facts. You talking hypotheticals? You got people getting injured. Chris Paul, Ben Simmons, Joel. Lim- no, nah, let's talk about who's on the oh, court. Injuries kind of do happen, Jimmy Butler. They could happen to it. anybody. Exactly. We got so so we can't discuss anything what? if we're gonna just say everybody could get injured. Right, Chris, Lonzo Ball, Brandon Ingram, Paul George could get injured. Anybody could get injured. So don't give me Chris. the injury stuff. So what are you I'm talking there? about? Who's there? Settle this. I, man. I, I don't know where Settle you're going. Uh, we know he's got to pick for All right, let's go to the producer for the scorecard. He likes you, man. All right, he now, might, what do you got? First no, off, it was it Lord Tennyson, not Shakespeare. Lord Tennyson, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but, McIntyre, you lost it with the happiness stuff. It's Bruce. Thank you. Oh, thank geez. you. Thank you. LeBron. I mean, look. Hey, let me speak to LeBron real quick because I know he's a big fan of yours. You talked to Maverick Carter. I think he, uh, Rich Paul just called you here. LeBron, you do what's best for yourself. Don't worry about this legacy nonsense. Okay, that's all talk and all noise. You do what's going to make you happy. If that means coming to sunny L.A. and playing in front of Jack Nicholson and winning an Oscar like Kobe, you do what's going to make you happy. All right, Broussard, back to your podcast. That was completely unnecessary. Okay, I felt felt like I needed to Everybody feels that way. Do what makes you happy, of course. Yeah, forget about legacy. Can but we, you, you're you assuming being in L.A. is going to make him happy. Well, I don't think he's what happy What about being in Northeast Ohio where he grew up, huh? He's been there. He's been there for a long so time. So what's wrong with that? Stop stop dissing Northeast Ohio. I know, I Mr. Ohio. I used to live there. That's right, right. Mr. Ohio. Leave it alone. What, All right, one nothing McIntyre. Here we go. Number two, uh, James Harden. Uh, who, I will give you props on this. James Harden's going to win the MVP. You called that a long time ago. Congratulations, Chris Broussard. You are a professional. Um, however, interesting discussion that you brought up. Mike D'Antoni's had two amazing point guards, James Harden and previously Steve Nash. And he's got Chris Paul. Now Chris too. Paul as well. Uh, in the James Harden versus Steve Nash debate, who's better? Well, Steve Nash, obviously. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Better career field goal shooter, Steve Nash. Better career three-point shooter, so that's Steve Nash. Whoa, whoa, on. whoa. Better free throw shooter for his career, Steve Nash. Lower, <laughs> Steve Nash. You actually be- brought up free throw shooting. 90% Was David Robinson better than Shaq? Uh, well, if you want to compare David Was Robinson. Was David Robinson better than Shaq? If you want to compare that, you can. Steve Nash, higher percentage <laughs> shooting right here. Gosh. Go ahead. From the foul line, three and field goals. Steve Nash, first team all NBA. Same as, same as James Harden. Assists, five for Steve Nash. Five times led the league in assists. James Harden once. I think Steve Nash, twice MVP. How many MVPs Harden got? I mean, we're giving him Let, one. Go ahead and talk. No, I just when wanted to done, put that. When you're done, I'm about to James obliterate Harden, your argument. James Harden eventually will get there, but for no, now. No, 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 no. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't soften well, it because you know you're about to get no, ransacked. No, no. Steve Nash, without question, 
better career than James Harden. There's no doubt about yeah, it. Yeah, there is no guys, doubt. James Harden already. If he if he doesn't play another NBA oh, that game, is a falsehood. It's not even <laughs> no. Close. Look, uh, Steve Har- J- James Harden is better than Steve Nash. Period. The right. end. Well, back it up with stats. Let's this one, no, I'm gonna back it up with facts. facts all right, facts, I don't facts. just read numbers. Stats I are facts. I watch the game stats and I facts. analyze. Okay. I can watch it and see. I got a, I got an eye test to go along with my numbers. All right. Okay. Now, look, Steve Nash. Steve Nash, great player. Don't want to take anything away from him. But let me say this. This is the truth. If he had not played for Mike D'Antoni, if he had not run into Mike D'Antoni toward the end, middle of his career. He would not only not have been a two-time MVP, he would not have been a Hall of Famer. Or he's going to be a Hall of Famer. He would not. Here's the fact. Chris, you, Here's you, a, you, let, you, listen, you no, you're going to bring again, facts. That I is am about if. to bring That's a fact. That's a big if statement. All right, I'm about to bring okay. facts. Okay. He played his first eight years of his career without Mike D'Antoni. Dallas, four, four, three of those years, he didn't even start. Right. Okay. Three of his first four years didn't even start. Started in Phoenix, then went to Dallas. Seven of those years, Steve, the great Steve Nash, didn't even average more than seven assists a game. For seven of his first eight years, he did not average seven, more than seven assists a game. Okay. That was playing for five years with Dirk Nowitzki, one of the all-time great scorers, and another 20-point scorer for several seasons, Michael Finley. Finley, Still wasn't Finley. giving you eight assists a game. Okay. That Dallas team, his last year in Dallas, the reason Mark Cuban let him go to Phoenix, which probably was a mistake. I'm saying probably, and I'm going to tell you why. He averaged 14 points, eight assists a game. And they went out in the first round okay. to Sacramento in five games. Dallas actually got better when Steve Nash left. Okay. Within two years, they were in the NBA Finals without Steve Nash. Then Nash goes to D'Antoni. Now, D'Antoni, in his style of play, his system, he, if you're the right type of point guard, you're a downhill point guard. You're an aggressive, attacking point guard. Jeremy Lin. That's my point. Jeremy Lin looked sensational for Mike D'Antoni. Ray Felton averaged 17 points and nine assists a game for Mike D'Antoni in New York. He's an All-American in Steve Nash gets there with D'Antoni, perfect fit. The rest is history for those two. Now, James Harden goes to Mike D'Antoni. And before he even gets with D'Antoni, Harden makes four all-star teams. Nash only made two all-star teams before he hooked up with D'Antoni. <laughs> two all-star teams in eight years. So wait, My are, point is co- that he was on the, the – the, the people thought he was on the decline until he got to D'Antoni and Phoenix. And that system – Energize him just like it did with Jeremy Lin, Ray Felton. And now let's look at it. James Harden versus Steve Nash. Under the same coach, in the same system. So wait, James, wait let me just, just to clarify, you want to compare just their time under D'Antoni? No, I just compared their time under other coaches. Under coaches, okay. And it's clearly Harden. Harden made four Austin okay. star teams. Nash made two. So we have two. two discussions. Hey, who was better without Harden, D'Antoni and who's better with D'Antoni? That's I'm what proved, you're going to say. I'm okay. using both of them to prove to you that wow. Harden is a better wow, player. Wow, what a reach. That hard, oh, going, your, your only argument is two MVPs. Is he better than And Kobe? all the stats, all the shooting what percentages. Did he ever average 30 points a game? Fine, scoring. Well, shooting percentage. Who's a better shooter? I take scoring over Fine. shooting percentage. Oh, really? Nash is a great shooter. Yeah, better but shooter so than Orton. Steve Offord. So is John Sunvold. You never heard of him. Wait, did so they ever Kyle lead the league Warmer. in assists five times? Did they lead the assist league in James five Harden. Times? James Harden under First Mike. First team all NBA, uh, John Sunvold? Under, Get out of here with that Under garbage. Mike Dan. You never heard of Sunvold. I have heard of a Miami Where'd Heat he shooter. Yeah, I know I the guy. I don't even know if he played he in the NBA. He did play for the Heat, yeah. He did. <laughs> Look. White guy. He was great in college, all right? Okay. This is the point. Under Dan Tony, James Harden gives you 10 assists He's a amazing. game. He's amazing. He's amazing. Essentially the same as Nash. Uh, Nash, gave Nash has left led the NBA. Oh, Harden, Harden once. led the league last year. Once. He's only played Nash. two years. One, He's two, only... three, four, five. Did Nash ever lead the NBA in assists mm-hmm. without Dan Tony? What, 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 what does that matter? Did he? No. What, who right, cares? So he led it five times. Under Dan Tony. Oh, my gosh. Who cares Harden who his coach has was? Harden played two years under Dan Tony. He's leading the league. In a, he led the league in assists once under Dan Tony last year. 11 assists mm-hmm. a game. First time ever as a point guard. 
Now, I Harden know. is not only, he's given, in his two years under Dan Tony, he's 30 points and 10 assists the game. Out. He's now, out. what's better, 30 and 10 or 15 and 10? But that's not the argument. What, what's better, 30 what points think, Chris? and 10? Obviously. I want to hear it from you. 30 points a game. 10 assists a game Chris, or 15 uh, points okay. and 10 assists. We, we, What's better? Obviously the 30. Chris, we let me let me no, I'm not done okay, with you. I'm not done with you. The Houston Rockets right now with James Harden running the point under the same coach that Steve Nash had. The number one rated offense of all time. Yeah. According better to basketball than the seven reference. seconds or the less. The number yeah. way better. Yeah. The Nash under Nash, Phoenix was ranked sixth all-time mm-hmm. offense. And 15th. That's it. Okay. Under Harden and D'Antoni, Houston number one this year, number 12 last year without Chris Paul. So Harden's team is better offensively. His statistics individually are better offensively yeah, than that. This is a All you one. got from me is field goal percentage, free throw three, percentage. And three, That's why he's and better. Three, and assists. Oh, and all shooter. NBA no, and MVP. Yeah, he led the assists in... No, the NBA I don't, five Yes, times. but he averaged 10 or 11 assists a game. Same as Harden. Don't tell me about okay, who led fine. the fair league. Enough, fair enough. Tell me about what the number was. Chris, we've been debating the entire season on here. This is the most illogical argument How? I've ever heard from you. What is your argument? You're trying that Nash shot better from the we're field? We're looking at the career of Steve Nash and the career of James Harden. We're not saying, oh, without Mike D'Antoni. Hey, okay, okay let's take I, Shaq away from Kobe. On, I, what the hell was Kobe without Shaq? I, he was nothing, two, and then he, he got Paul Gasol. Time, and then he, he got Paul Gasol. He was nothing. Without Shaq? You just said that. I mean, that. that's what you're Kobe saying. Kobe Bryant was nothing Until without Shaq. Until he got Paul Gasol. Really? Yeah, he was scoring 81, and they were losing in the first round. What are you looking around for? There's nobody coming here to help. You just said Kobe Bryant was nothing he without Shaquille He was a Shaquille scoring O'Neal. machine. He was Dominique Wilkins. And oh then he got God. Pau Gasol and won Dominique a title. Dominique never scored 81. Dominique, Dominique did not score Dominique 81. Dominique never averaged 35 points a game. Dominique did not average 35 points Dominique a game. Dominique never won an MVP. Never won an MVP. All right, Kobe Bryant did all so that. So I just Shaq. said that exact same stuff to you. Steve Nash led the NBA and assists five times. Steve Nash has two MVPs. And you're dismissing it, Chris. You're the same argument. Because I gave you... I showed you how Harden's team Harden's has been team. better than 100%. Nash's team. No, no doubt. There's no argument. I gave there. you how but Harden's. But this is Steve Nash oh, no. versus James I Harden. gave you how Harden's individual statistics are better than Steve. Well, Nash's. I disputed that with facts. Thirty points isn't be- with, with thirty what? points. With okay. shooting percentage, that's it. So shooting percentage doesn't matter now. Okay, good. That I'm not great saying it's irrelevant. I'll that away for later. What I'm saying is okay. points per game and assists per game are they trump. Shooting percentage. Can, can you give me the order of what trumps what? Where's yeah, MVP? Yeah. Where's leading the league in assists? Can you just You're give me the order? You're not going to win. Who leads the league in field goal percentage now? Is it DeAndre Jordan, some big a man? Dis- different league. Win MVP? Different era. Different era. Oh, era schmera. It's I always a big argument. man. Okay. Look, I give you. Steve Nash is a better shooter than James Harden. There's no question about that. Hundred percent. But James Harden is a better player than Steve Nash was. Uh, again, that's the crux I of the do, matter. I, I don't. And think I can prove it team wise well, and listen, statistics. This is a tough one because Nash played 18 years. James Harden, I believe, is his ninth season. So it's like we're comparing 18 versus half no, of the I'm career. Not, I'm not even looking so, at the end of his career or I'll even the you. beginning. Here's the only concession start. I'll make. I'm looking James at the Harden, prime. James Harden will end up with a better career than Steve Nash. But at this juncture, no. Steve Nash, better than James Harden. That's, That's not the you, question. Yeah, what's the question? Then? James Harden is playing at a higher level right now than Steve Nash ever played at. No, I'll disagree. He's Steve averaging Nash twice as many MVP points. awards. So, so points so, is everything. So hold on, he he's giving you the same number of assists. The a point guard leads the league in assists five times, and it doesn't matter, Chris. But no, I'm not saying it doesn't matter. My point is, when he led the league in assists, he was averaging ten or 11 a game. Right. James Harden under Mike D'Antoni averages 10 assists a oh, game. Well, I, Whether it leads the league or not might depend on another could, player. Could be I'm right. just saying the statistic is the same. Okay. And on top of giving you the same number of assists Nash gave you, he gives you twice as many points. points. How can he not be better? Don't give me the he two MVP argument. Right. Shaq only got one. Was Nash better than Shaq? Oh, come on. Stop. Was he better than Kobe? Nash better than Shaq. They're not even the same position. Then don't That's give silly. me the MVP argument. Did you, did you really put Steve Nash's name in Look, the same sentence? If you to give Shaq? this to Nash, hey, he's not to him. It's fine. No, he's going to save his last one for me on the, nah, on the final ahead. one. I wanted to give it to McIntyre. Then he had the Kobe line at the end. Kobe's nothing without Shaq. I, I got to give it to Broussard for that. Let's also, Clint on. Capella leads the 
NBA and field goal. Look at that. I love so, how he's so bringing Clint stats. So Capella yeah. is better than Kevin Durant because he shoots a higher field goal percentage. Really? He is? That's they what you're the same, saying. They play the That's same what position. you're saying. Okay, no. No, I've never said that. You just, when, that when was I'm your comparing argument. Steve Nash, point guard shooter, to James Harden, point guard shooter, Nash for his career shot 5% better. That's significant. Let's he's move on to the final shooter. question. Let's move on to the final question. Another <laughs> loss. For, we saw, you're you're about to get, what are you talking about? I, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you a bit of a layup here. Coach of the year for the NBA. There's still 17 games left. Things could happen. Uh, I got to say, there's a lot of great coaches this year. Mike D'Antoni, who we just spent 15 minutes on. <laughs> been pretty good. Terry Stotts in Portland. I mean, they're the number three seed playing some inspired basketball. Doc Rivers with the Clippers. I mean, they lose Chris Paul jobs. and Blake Griffin. Doc Rivers. I would say this is the best job Doc Rivers has ever done. Better than ever. With, with the Celtics. Ooh. I mean, he had a super team. You had Kevin uh, Garnett, Ray Allen, ever. Paul Pierce. This has been tremendous I'd for Doc Rivers. Boston and We've Alvin Gentry of the Pelicans has been out of his mind, losing Cousins, and they're still in the playoff race. Yep. However, my vote's going to Brad Stevens of the Boston Celtics. Okay, They lost their number one scorer last year, Isaiah Thomas, their number wait, one wait, defender. Wait, 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 wait. You really using that? Well, uh, can you allow me? To, can you with? allow me to build my argument? They lose Isaiah Thomas. But you're leaving out significant Chris, facts. Chris, 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 Chris. They lost their starting backcourt. Can I just jump to that? They lost their starting small forward. They lost their number one bench guy, Kelly Olynyk. Basically, three of their top four players gone. Kelly Olynyk. Kel- what I said. That's a part of your argument. No, no. I'm saying when you're a head coach and you have a team that goes to the Easter Conference Finals and then you dump half the roster and he's now back number two seed with. 19-year-old Jason Tatum and 20-year-old Jalen Brown. Gordon Hayward goes down in the opener. Everybody writes off the Celtics. And Brad Stevens has them number two in the league. Kyrie Irving's been tremendous. He was an MVP candidate briefly. Oh, who, I Kyrie give, Irving, who'd he replace? Isaiah Thomas. Oh, okay. I would say Brad Stevens, without question, is my vote for Coach of the Year. Wow. The floor is yours. Look, Brad Stevens and all those coaches you mentioned, but I think Brad Stevens would be ahead of those guys. Terry Stotts, great. Mm. All of them that you mentioned have done a great job. And don't forget about Quinn Schneider in Utah. Quinn Schneider, yes. They, they now, I did leave one name out because I know you're going there. I don't want anybody thinking I'm disrespecting. No, it, it's some good, good, great coaching jobs. And look, if Brad Stevens wins it, you're not going to get an argument from me. He's done a great job. I don't think you did justice to his argument. But I think he did a great job. Oh, when you throw Boy, you, all the things you're going to throw in it, I'm just saying, like, you throw in he lost Isaiah Thomas. Well, he gained Kyrie Irving. Right, I mean, but he I think also, everybody again, would take that. Do you know how tough it is? I don't know. I know you, you don't have much that he coaching lost Kelly experience. Olenek. I coach a first grade basketball team. <laughs> so I know what it's like to lose a bunch of starters <laughs> after a total new group, and now you're still contending for the playoffs. But continue, continue. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, here's my. I would go with. Dwayne Casey in Toronto. He's been tremendous. He is, I would, I, I, I've thought most of the year is going to be Brad Stevens, but I think now I'd have to go with Dwayne Casey. Here's why. First of all, he's got the Toronto Raptors on a 61 win pace. Mm-hmm. Boston started tremendously, especially without Gordon Hayward. They were 22 and 4. Since then, they're 24 and 17. Good, but Not, nothing yeah. spectacular. What was it after the 16 game winning streak? Yeah, nice yeah, well, I don't know exactly. But What's yeah, the longest 24 win streak Raptors had this year? Do you know? Or? I, I don't know. I know, they, I know they won like 15 of their last 16 or something, something like that. that. Okay. Now, the Toronto Raptors are the only team in the NBA that's in the top five in offensive mm-hmm. efficiency and defensive efficiency. I didn't know. I was that is phenomenal. I mean, Boston is an imbalanced team. They're the best defensive team in the league, but they're 16th in offense. Right, that, that's what the makes Toronto it stunning Raptors, that they're second in the but East. But the Toronto Raptors, I mean, you got a great backcourt in DeMar DeRozan and Kyle Lowry, then a bunch of guys that people really haven't Wait, heard of. Wait, timeout. That's I incorrect. Mean, you got Serge that is Ibaka, not. Serge, I'm not saying they're not. They Four of their play. five starters are back. Yeah, yeah. From last but year. But when they won 51. They're back, but they weren't. Like, Serge Ibaka's a good player. Jonas Valanciunas is a good player, but not spectacular players. He doesn't have the same talent that a lot of these other elite teams have. But yet, they are the most balanced team in the NBA. Oh, meaning, me, great, let's just meaning, ask. meaning great offensively, great defensively. Who, who's let got better you, talent, the Celtics or the Raptors? Probably the Kyrie's Raptors. Kyrie's the best player. Yeah, but, probably the Raptors. Okay, so the Raptors. They, they got two all-stars, although saying, eh, it's close because they have Horford. Horford's Horford, an all-star. Right. So we both have two all-stars and then a bunch of role players. Now, here's the thing, too. 
Dwayne Casey has switched up his coaching style a bit. I will, yes. And that is tremendous. Last year, the Raptors only, they were in the bottom 10th in three-pointers made per game. Mm -hmm. They only made eight three-pointers a game. Only about eight teams made fewer three-pointers per game than the Raptors last season. Now, the Raptors are actually tied for sixth in three-pointers made per game. And you said it yourself. Same players. Yeah. Same players. Yeah, Casey it. told them, get in the gym, start working on the three-point shot, and now they make the same amount of three-pointers a game as the Golden State Warriors. Think about that. No, no, from, I'm, I'm from impressed with Casey. From hardly ever hitting the three to now hitting it all the time, uh, that, that is tremendous. So I, I think the case is clear-cut. You have the most balanced team in the league. You, you've changed, you've added something to your game, the three-point shot. You know, I, I just think, look, look at some of the names of these guys. Even you, You Boston haven't even fan. mentioned Fred, Hold on. Fred Van Fleet That's what I'm yet. saying. I love that guy. Fred Van Fleet, DeLon Wright. He was nice. You Pascal were watching him college basketball. Syacum, no, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Jacob Podol. I mean, guys mm-hmm. nobody's heard of. Right. And they have Ar- O.J. Anyawu. O.G. Anyawubi. He was nasty in O.G. Anyawubi. Yeah, he's an O.G. Obi-Wan Kenobi. <laughs> I mean, he got... He got freaking Obi-Wan Kenobi running off the bench. That's a great line. <laughs> they might be the best bench in the league. I, I, you're almost Wayne convincing Casey me. Casey Durs deserves credit. You're om- I love Brad, but come on. The, you can't, well, the, you can't What I like best is you built a case for him as like a tactician, as X's and O's guy. And Chris, I got to be honest. There aren't a lot of black coaches in the NBA. We don't say that about black coaches well, enough. That's what we he's done. We should. And what he's done do in Toronto well. has been tremendous. I mean, I applaud Casey a lot. You almost, almost convinced I, me. I clearly convinced No, no, almost. I, I, I feel bad. Almost. No, here's my problem. This, I is get... a, this has been a no. beat No, down. no, no, no. Let me, before this you. Is, if you give it, he's going to give it to you because no, no. he loves no, Brad No, 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 no. Before we go but to the But this has been a straight no. up annihilation. Before we go to the scorecard. They won 56 games two years ago with almost the exact same roster. Okay. okay. So I, they may win 61 this year, maybe 58. So. Are we seeing that much improvement, or maybe are the Cavs just coming down a little bit? We've seen a steady ascension for Boston Brad Stevens won in Boston. How many games last year? I don't know the answer. Maybe fifty-one or fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-three. With a you they change the entire roster. This year. You change the entire roster. But their best player you lose. They lost second their best player. best player, and they got a player who's better. And they lost Gordon Hayward, who was factored in, they and they were going to be dominant him last year, though. Exactly, they were going to have him this year. Expectations massive. We're almost Stevens needing the expectations. Great. There's no doubt. This is a tough one. I mean, I, th- I think I'm right as usual. I but don't know that you think you're I, right. G- give I it to him, it. man, because it's been no, it's no, been no, so no I don't want no pity Please, victories. Nah, give it to him. Give him this one. Give him this one. But. It's close, but when McIntyre brings up Kelly Olenek, I got to go with Bruce <laughs> Oh, no, you did not go there. <laughs> That's why they call it Knockdown J, my man. This is unbelievable. I'm not, I'm gonna <laughs> not, I'm not going <laughs> nowhere. I'm not going nowhere. I'm back. Nah, look, man, you 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 gave it a good battle, but you you fought uphill. You you picked arguments dude, that where, where, this, this Steve Nash James Harden thing. Hold on, I, let I'm me just, let me just I'm recap. Let me recap. That. You told me that LeBron is better off not going to the finals than going to the finals in the East. But that's, I think he's gonna go to the finals argument. in the West. But with that the wasn't the question. He might. He's that great. But that wasn't the question. Then secondly, you actually tell me Steve Nash is better than James Harden. No, at I'm this sorry. juncture he is. It's, it's a fact. Not. I mean, no. I hit you with all these numbers that you can't refute, and then you try really to go with field goal percentage, percentage, free throw percentage, every shooting category that matters. Free throw percentage yeah, yeah, does not bit. come up. True in shooting a, in percentage. A Steve Nash, argument. MVP award. Steve Nash, All NBA, tied. I mean, come on. And then you, you know, we can you do just, this all day. I just, I, I just love look, NBA man, and winning look, debates, man. This I, is so I, fun. <laughs> what are we doing next week? Commenter's going to come strong I, at you, I feel son. for you, man, because I know he wanted to give you the <laughs> boss. I don't even he need He wanted it. to give you Nash, too. I'm like LeBron. I don't need no superstar. I'm just going to go out and keep doing triple doubles. I'm going to do Did my thing. Did you hear what he said? It was 3 nothing. me. Uh, yeah, that's... What were you? You just not even listening to that. Look, right, my on. man J Mac, I love him. Look, he's got perseverance. He's got oh, diligence. Remember the Dwayne Wade commercial? He keeps getting knocked down, but keeps getting up. That's my man J Mac. He D-Wade. will be back next week, despite this beatdown. He'll be energetic. He'll be confident. He'll be smiling, he'll win. and he'll bring his best. Yeah. I'll win, but he'll bring his best. <laughs> I like that in you. I'm teaching you the game, my man. Uh, Signing a lot, off man. for Knockdown J. My man.
All right, we're going to welcome in our guest for today, Evan Daniels. He's an FS1 college basketball insider. He is the host of the Sidelines with Evan Daniels podcast. He's a recruiting insider for 24-7 Sports, and he knows all things about all the stars in college basketball and high school. So we're just going to pick his brain as we head into March Madness, and, and we'll certainly related to the NBA. So, Evan, welcome to In the Zone, man. I'm glad to have you here. Man, I appreciate you having me on. Excited to do it. And, uh, yeah, this should be fun. All right. So, of course, we're fresh off Selection Sunday, Evan. So, give me your biggest takeaway from the bracket. I think my biggest takeaway uh, when I first looked at the bracket and figured out who was in the tournament and who wasn't was the NCAA selection committee's criteria in terms of making the tournament and I'm specifically uh Chris talking about the the teams right there on the bubble and it was clear that the committee really took into account teams that had signature wins under their belt teams like Arizona State uh, and teams like Oklahoma you know Oklahoma finished the season eight uh eight, 18 and 13 and they they really sputtered uh, down the stretch lost eight of their last 10 uh, but they, in the, the non-conference, they beat teams like USC. They beat Wichita State when they were number three in the country. They had wins over TCU and Texas Tech, uh, and they beat Kansas. So I, I think even though they sputtered down the stretch, the committee took those big wins into account, and they obviously put them in the tournament. And same goes with Arizona State. You know, they were really good in the non-conference, 12-1, and one, and, and beat Xavier neutral site and beat Kansas at Kansas. Uh, but then they really struggled in the Pac-12 play and, and actually had a losing record in conference where they were 8-10. and 10. And a school like USC, who, who finished a little better, they were 14-7 and seven in the Pac-12, didn't get in the tournament. So I think the committee really took into account the teams that had those signature key wins. I got to keep it real with you. I, I don't understand how USC is not in the tournament. How do you finish second in a major conference, second in the conference tournament, and then they put in a team that's ninth place, Arizona State. I know they had the wins over Kansas and uh, Xavier early in the season, really early, November and December. But it just seems – it seems to me like that belittles the conference schedule or the conference regular season and even the tournament. Um, do you think I, – I, my feeling is the only explanation really is that they took into consideration – some of these teams like Louisville, Oklahoma State, and I don't really have a problem with them being left out, but those two and um, USC who were named in that F federal investigation for wrongdoing, you know, in, in collegiate uh, athletics. What, what's your thought on that? You think that played a role? Well, somebody asked the committee chair, and I can't remember who I saw. I saw it on Twitter. Yeah, he, I know they've uh, denied it, yeah. About it, and they, they denied it. And, 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 and I don't know. I mean, it's a fair point. Uh, obviously, I, I didn't think that Louisville did enough to get in the tournament. I, I kind of agree with you, or I do agree with you, on USC. I mean, they were 23-11. and 11. They finished second in their league, 14-7. and seven. I, I think – with them is, is they didn't have that signature win that the committee was looking for. But at the same time, I'm with you. You know, they finished pretty strong. Um, I don't know. When you have a record like that in conference, especially in, in yeah. that league, they, they made it to the Pac-12 championship and, and played a pretty decent uh, game against Arizona, who I think is a, a team really coming on. But I, I think it's also of note is the committee really didn't value the Pac-12 that much. Arizona won the league and won the tournament, and I thought they were underseeded at, at four. I thought they were at least a three. Yeah, yeah. Now, who? Let's, let's cut to the chase. Who do you have reaching the final four, and why don't you break down why with each team? Yeah, I, I went with uh, Arizona, Xavier, Villanova, and Duke, and I'll kind of walk through why. Yeah, and Arizona, and we'll just stick with them because I was just talking about them. Uh, one, I think they have the best player in the tournament I think they have the best prospect in the tournament I'm of course referring to DeAndre Ayton and he's been an absolute man child as of late and in the semifinals and finals uh, in the Pac-12 tournament he scored 62 points and reeled in 34 rebounds I mean it's yeah. it's absurd what he's been, he's been able to do and I mean think about it this way two weeks ago Arizona didn't didn't know if they were going to get their coach Sean Miller back uh, due to uh, a report that came out uh, that ended up um, having some holes in it. 
and then Alonzo Trier is, is ineligible. Now they got both of those guys back, and DeAndre Ayton is playing at a, at a different level. I just think that team is really turning it on at just the right time. I do think that they're in uh, a pretty tough – they could potentially play Kentucky in the second round yeah. and, and Virginia in the Sweet 16, and I, obviously both of those games would be um, tough tests. But I think Sean Miller's got his team playing their best ball right now. And I also think DeAndre Ayton's the type of guy uh, that you can ride to a Final Four. He's that good. All right, so you had – so so that's Arizona. Tell me about why you picked Villanova for the Final Four. Yeah, I actually think Villanova is the best team in the country when they're fully healthy. Uh, this is a, a terrific group. They obviously have a terrific coach in, in, in Jay Wright. But I think it starts with their point guard, uh, Chris Jalen Brunson. You can make a case – is arguably the best point guard in the country. Uh, there's not much he can't do on the court. He's such a good facilitator. He plays at such a good pace. He changes speeds. And he's a tough competitor. He can see the floor. He's got good vision. And then they also have one of the best perimeter prospects and players in all of college basketball, Kale Bridges. He's six foot seven. He's long. He's really improved as a shooter, shooting at a 40% clip. Uh, I actually think he's going to be a, a lottery pick. Uh, come June in the NBA draft. So th- this is also Jay Wright's best shooting team. That's at least what he told me. They're right around 40% clip from three. And they have, they've really struggled with injuries throughout the year, and they've finally got everybody healthy, and, and they're playing their best ball. They beat Xavier twice, who's a one seed. They beat, Kentucky, they beat Tennessee. Uh, I'm a big fan of Xavier. I, I think they're going to make the Final Four. Yeah, so tell me why Xavier, about Xavier. Yeah. yeah, Xavier coming out of the West. Um, and I actually think um, that lower pod and, and maybe even the West is one of the more weaker uh, regions. But I, I like the Xavier team, the 25. I think it's Chris Mack's best team at Xavier. And they have a, a really good scoring punch. Um, but they're two seniors, Trayvon Blewett and, and J.P. McCura. And, and Blewett has really improved all facets of his game. He's raised his points averages. He's shooting it at a better clip this year, over 40% from three. And I think their point guard play has continued to improve. Quentin Gooden um, is a bigger lead guard. He's strong, tough, physical, and he's improved as a shooter, especially late here in the season. And when he's making shots, I think they're a different team. And then Ennis Cantor's brother, Karim Cantor, has really emerged in the post, and he gives them a versatile threat that can step out on the floor, that can score it on the block. They've beaten Cincinnati. They've beaten Seton Hall twice. Uh, I like the Xavier group quite a bit. Okay, finally, your fourth pick for the Final Four was Duke. Tell me why you like them. Yeah, I I think this is probably the most talented team in the country, and and they've been, Chris, pretty up and down throughout this season. They're 26-7. and You know, they lost in the the semis of the ACC tournament to uh, to rival North Carolina, who they actually lost to twice. But I I think talent prevails. And I, I think especially in the NCAA tournament, uh, a lot of times the teams with the most NBA players and the most talent, the team that wins. And outside of DeAndre Ayton, I think Marvin Bagley is, is the, um, the best player in this event. He's six foot eleven and he can do it all. Uh, he's much like Ayton is a guy that you can really ride to, to win. And he, he's that good. And, and next to him in the post is Wendell Carter, uh, six foot ten. Those two play off each other really well. But they also have experience. Uh, in Grayson Allen on the perimeter, and I think he's starting to play a lot better. I think the X factor here is, is Trayvon Duvall. If he can facilitate and get paint touches uh, and, and, and create opportunities um, for others, then I think they can make a, a, a deep run. And this is a team that does have concerns, Chris, on the defensive end. Um, the last nine games they played 93% zone. And I think that's in ultimately why North Carolina is able to knock them off because mm-hmm. they were getting wide open threes out of that zone. Um but at the end of the day, I just love their talent. And I do think that Sweet 16 matchup potentially against Michigan State is, is going to be one of the games of the tournament if it happens. Yeah, no question. All right, so who you got winning it all? I'm going with Villanova. Mm. Um, get this. So they, they've been dealing with injuries throughout the season. Phil Booth uh, missed some time. Colin Gillespie missed some time. Jermaine Samuels missed some time. When they've been at full strength, and had their full roster available to play, Villanova hasn't lost a game this season. Wow. I mentioned okay. their shooting. Uh, I, the, I, I think that they're one of the best shooting teams in the country. And they, their, their pieces fit, Chris. I mean, when you have one of the best point guards, one of the best perimeter players, experienced guards, and then a freshman post player and a Mar- Mari Spellman that gives them a different look from a scoring standpoint and can really rebound, 
uh, throw all that in, and you've got one of the best coaches in college basketball, Jay Wright. Uh, I'm picking uh, Villanova to cut down the nets for the second time in three years. All right, so I'm filling out my bracket based on you, based on your knowledge. So <laughs> you will be getting a ring from me if uh, if it goes awry, <laughs> especially early. No. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But look, as you know, In the Zone is mainly an NBA podcast, so we want to break down the tournament from that perspective. You mentioned DeAndre Ayton, the seven-footer out of Arizona, who's on many draft boards. He's the number one pick, many mock drafts. Um, Tell me how good Ayton is and how you think his game will translate to the next level and what type of player he'll be at that level. I know this is is probably going to sound crazy, but I'm going to say it. I I think he has Hall of Fame-level talent. Yeah, I heard somebody else say that too. So, uh, yeah, I've been hearing that quite a bit now. I'm going to take claim for saying it before that person. Said <laughs> you know who I'm know talking who, about. I know, right? you're refer- <laughs> I know who you're referring to. <laughs> I-, I tweeted it a couple weeks ago, but I, I think <laughs> if-, if you were trying to draw up a post player's body, you couldn't draw it up any better than Deion Reed. He's got these big, wide, strong shoulders. He's got really long arms. Um, he's strong. You know, he's just starting to lift weights. He lifted weights for the first time in his life when he got to Arizona. Uh, he's mm. quick off his feet. He's nimble. He's athletic. And the thing about DeAndre Ayton, Chris, is if you saw him early in high school, you saw a guy uh, that didn't really know who he was. You know, he, he, he would tell you that he was a small forward in high school. He didn't play hard. Uh, honestly, I think at times he was bored. So there was a lot of question marks about DeAndre Ayton really coming into the summer. Did, did he get it? Did he, did he understand how to play hard? Was the light going to come on? And really in the summer, you know, word out of Arizona was that it was coming on quickly. And, and I think Sean Miller has done uh, and deserves a, a lot of credit for this. He's, he's found a way to, 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 to make this kid play hard, but he's also improving at such a rapid rate. His footwork has improved. His offensive ability has improved. He's always had um, the potential to be a shooter. And I, I think he has range out to the college line right now at about 22 feet, but he can make them from mid-range too. Uh, his his mechanics are pretty good. He's got a, a little bit of a line line drive ball, but um, he he's going to be a really good shooter in time. I, I just think he's the full package uh, for for the the modern day post guy, and uh, I think he's uh, really honestly the the easy choice as the number one prize heading into the draft. Does he remind you at all of Joel Embiid, who's kind of taken NBA by storm? That's not a that's not a bad comparison. I, I think um, he's probably. I think he's going to be a little stronger. Um, mm. You know, Joel came on a little late, later, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I think that's a fair comparison. I think Embiid's uh, footwork is probably a little better now, and he's a little more polished in terms of his moves, which, I mean, that's uh, that's no knock on DeAndre. Yeah. He's still pretty young. But uh, I think that's, uh, that's not a bad comparison because I, I think Embiid can impact the game on both ends of the floor, and that's, I see long. DeAndre Ayton uh, being being similar in that regard. All right, the guy that took the college basketball season by storm, or at least the first three quarters of it, was Trey Young at Oklahoma. A lot of people thought he, you know, was reminiscent of Steph Curry. Certainly has been. Um, I thought early on he was a guy that might have to be considered for the number one pick in the draft. Uh, I was talking to a pro scout today. He told me his opinion, just one guy's opinion, but his opinion was that Trey Young was a backup point guard in the NBA. What is your take on Trey? Obviously, he struggled lately, but what's your take on him? Yeah, I mean, that's not an unfair opinion. I would assume that that scout probably would reference his strength, um, probably references who he's going to guard, which I think is probably the biggest concern with the Trey Young. Um, all that said, he's, he's had a ridiculous season. I mean, he's put up, uh, the numbers he's put up has been absurd, especially through his first 20 games. And right now he's sitting at 27 points, 8.8 rebounds. Uh, the, the three point percentage has dipped some, he's at 36%. And I think when he was in high school, just, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, The thing about him in high school was that he had a reputation for being a volume shooter and a volume scorer. And really more, at that time, kind of a last resort passer. Now, some of that had to do with he was always the best player on his team. Uh, outside, well, Mo Can, he played with 
out. In AAU, he played with Michael Porter, but those two guys took all the shots. Yeah. Um, but I think the area he's improved the most is his ability to create opportunities for others. So he's a much better passer than I, I realized he was. Um, and obviously, the first part of the season, he shot the ball a lot better than he is now. He, that percentage has dips. Part of that's due to shot selection. That's something he's going to have to sure up when he gets to the NBA. Um, he's better than he's better than I gave him credit for. He was a guy we had like right around the twenty-five spot coming out of of high school. Okay. Um, but he's definitely tailed off some uh, to, to to end this season. But this is a kid that has ridiculous range, and and he can really create, and he can really handle the basketball, and he's shifty, man. He's really crafty, and he's got those nifty finishes at the goal, the high glass finishes, the floaters. And he's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I got to tell you, I'm glad Oklahoma's in the tournament. You know, whether they deserve it or not, we can argue about it. <laughs> but I'm glad they put him For in sure. there because I do want to see Trey Young in that tournament. Um, you mentioned Marvin Porter – or I'm sorry, Michael Porter Jr. Uh, obviously, he missed most of the season with an injury. He's back now. Uh, do you think he can play himself into maybe a top five pick in this draft? I do. And I, I actually have him right around that range on, on my personal big board. I think I had him at five or six. And, you know, obviously if he's, if he's able to have a game or two in the NCAA tournament that sticks out, and I think a lot of the NBA scouts will, will go try to see him play because they only had an opportunity uh, really once uh, during the season to see him. But yeah. it's, it's hard to find six foot nine, uh, pushing 6'10", perimeter prospects with the athletic ability and the shooting scoring ability that Michael Porter possesses. And I think coming out of high school, he was probably tracking as uh, right there with Aiton Bagley. I mean, you could make an argument between those three. I I had him three uh, in. Um, So he's right there. And I, you know, I, look, we still have a long ways to go and there's going to, he's going to look great in workouts, Chris, like those individual workouts and, uh, that, that the NBA guys are going to see this summer. He's going to look terrific in those settings. And I think, as you know, once draft time gets here, needs are going to play uh, a major factor yep. into the order. And, you know, I, outside of, of Luka Doncic, the top of this draft, there's not a lot of perimeter scores. You know, Aiton's a big man, has a power forward. I mentioned Doncic, he's a, he's a perimeter prospect. And uh, Jaron Jackson's a power forward. And those are all the guys at the top so I think teams that are looking for a a wing player uh, with skill and athletic ability uh, are really going to like Michael Porter now there's some issues you know he he, he's not very strong I think he needs to get better off the bounce Um, and people have questioned his toughness at times but his talent his raw natural ability uh, is through the roof I've heard some comparisons to Kevin Durant is that are those fair I mean not that he'll be that good necessarily but that right. type of game, yeah, yeah. That it, it's that type of game. I, I'm not big on comparisons, especially to to Hall of Famers. But yep. I, I think I think I, I think I know where you're going with that, and I, I think that's that's pretty fair. Uh, that's how he plays. Uh, he's got he's he's got the ability to play like some face up four, which obviously Kevin can do too. But he's a he's a perimeter scorer, uh, and and he's in that mold. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Luka Doncic. Um, do you know much about him? I know obviously he's not in college basketball or anything like that, but do you know much about him and what yeah. type of prospect he is? You know, unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to see him play in person, but I've gone through a lot of tape of him on Synergy. And, I mean, this is a, uh, a kid that's playing against grown men and has been. Uh, he's currently with Real Madrid and uh, from Slovenia. He's six foot seven. Uh, he's skilled. Uh, he can score the ball in a variety of ways. I think he's improving as a shooter. He's not consistent from long range from what I've seen, uh, but has pretty decent com- mechanics. He's a good passer. But, you know, I, I think with him and, and the argument for him is he's playing much higher level competition than what college basketball would be. Yep. And over the summer, you know, he was on the Slovenian squad that won Euro basket and, and, and won a gold medal. And I mean, he was a huge part of it. And, you know, he was EuroLeague MVP of the month back in October. I mean, he's this kid is internationally has a lot of respect, and uh, he's really talented. Now, there's always a player in the tournament, you know, who watch plays great, and then his draft stock soars. You think about Derek Williams back a few years ago with Arizona. 
as the second pick, Michael Kidd Gilchrist. You know, a lot of people thought he might go number one over his teammate Anthony Davis. He played so well in the tournament. Give me a player who you think could be the star of the tournament and see his stock rise. This one's a tough one because some of the guys that I kind of pinpoint uh, for this type of question are on teams that I don't think can make deep runs. Okay. So I'm going to just throw a couple names at you. Um, you know, Colin Sexton, as I think, is going to go in the top ten in the in the, the NBA draft. In fact, I think he's going to be the first point guard taken okay. off the board just because of his moxie, his toughness, his his grits. He's honestly outside of Josh Jackson and Kid Gilchrist, he's up there as like the most competitive players in high school that I've ever covered. Um, Daniel, who, who Gaffer does he? Who won. does who does Sexton remind you of? His game. Oh, for that's those a great who question. Seen him. Um, I'm not huge in comparisons unless they really stick out. He, he's he's kind of in the Allen Iverson mold. Okay. Um, probably, you know, I didn't see Iverson in high school, but I, I would guess that he's a little stronger than he was in high school, um, and not as quick. But he's just a relentless driver. So he's more he, of a score to, first guy. Yeah, he's definitely a score first guy. Okay. Um, and I mean, he is relentless. I mean, he gets paint touches whenever he wants. He's a really good finisher through traffic, through contact, and he's really improved as a long-range shooter. But, I mean, Chris, I don't know if you like trash talkers, but he's the best I've seen in high school. Really? Uh, the best I've seen. High I school? I got a good story for you. Yeah, for sure. So, last year, um, he's playing against Penny Hardaway's high school team. Okay. And he's matched up with Penny Hardaway's son, and he's cooking. And next thing you know, he's at the free-throw line, talking crap to Penny while he's shooting free throws. And they're going back and forth jawing throughout the – Penny Hardaway, (laughs) NBA legend. I mean, this dude doesn't back down from anyone. I just – now, he can get a little too too into the trash talk and too into that aspect, but he he just plays with such – such toughness and, and competitiveness, and I, I, I think he's going to be the first point guard taken in the draft. Interesting, interesting. Uh, any other names? Yeah, Daniel Gafford over at Arkansas is a, a kid that's starting to emerge, and I don't think Arkansas is going to make a deep run, but he's averaging 12 points, six rebounds a game in just 22 minutes. And this is a kid that was more thought of as a top 30, 40 guy coming out of high school, but he's really emerged, six foot eleven. Runs rim to rim really well. He's got a nice set of mitts. Uh, he's active. He's quick off his feet. He rebounds. There's a lot of tools to work with. Uh, so he's a guy I would keep an eye on. Uh, Lonnie Walker is another one over at Miami. Uh, okay. Six foot five perimeter player. He can score it. He's a very, very good athlete uh, from Pennsylvania. Um, and he can shoot it too. So I, I think he's another name to keep an eye on. I was going to ask you for kind of an under the radar guy, kind of like a Donovan Mitchell, who you know has come out of, I don't want to say kind of out of nowhere, but certainly nobody expected what he's done this year with the Utah Jazz when he came out of U, out of Louisville. Is there a guy, or maybe it's one of the three you named earlier, um, but is there a guy like that that you could see in the draft? Yeah, I think the guy right now, and he's really quickly emerging, and he's a big name because he plays for a, a really good team in Kentucky. Che Gilgis Alexander for Kentucky is really starting to ramp things up, and I think he's a big reason uh, that Kentucky is starting to hit their stride late. And this is a kid that wasn't a McDonald's All-American. He's a Canadian. He's got really good size for the position. He's six foot five. He's got long arms. He moves really well. They play him on the ball. Um, but he's averaging 14 points, five assists a game. And what I like about him is he competes on both ends. He's a two-way guy. Uh, he can guard multiple spots on the defensive end. And then offensively, he, he, he does a really good job of getting into the paint, facilitating. And the knock on him in high school was that he couldn't shoot. Well, he's 21 of 53 on the season, 40% clip from three. Uh, so he's really emerging, and I think if Kentucky is going to make any kind of run in the tournament, he's going to be a big part of it. And I, I think that he's he's moved his way into the top 20 in the draft easily. Okay, cool, cool. Let me ask you this before we go. Um, obviously, there was this big Yahoo Sports report a few weeks ago about the federal investigation and you know things that are going on with the NCAA, the scandal and everything. In, in covering the – 
conference tournaments and just covering NCAA basketball this year, what what have you know? What's kind of the scuttlebutt? What is the feeling, the sentiment around the nation uh, when you get around these big time programs with this all this stuff going on? Well, I think there's a lot of, I don't want to say scared people, but there's a lot of cautious people. There's a lot of, you know, look, this, this, ever since the FBI investigation started back in September, it's been the talk of the sport. And it's really been a, a black eye and a cloud hanging over the sport ever since. And, you know, once the Yahoo story dropped, and then it's just been one, one thing after another. And I, I think that the, you know, it's, it's been a bad look for college basketball, but I think, and I, 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 the thing is, is I think that anyone that's covered it or been around it or been in it have known that stuff that came out in the FBI investigation was happening. Yeah. But it, it was, it was very um, surreal to see it on paper and to see assistant coaches getting arrested. And, you know, look, I talked to – the day that thing came out, I probably talked to 25 coaches. And every single one of them, not, not, not one of them, said that they thought any of that stuff those guys were doing was illegal or they could get arrested for it. Now, unethical, yeah, but no one thought it was illegal. And, then, and I mean, honestly, that FBI investigation is, sh- is shaking up all of college basketball. Do you have a strong opinion on what changes should be made? I wouldn't this- say that I have a strong I, I wouldn't say that I have a strong opinion. Um, I do and I now I, I want to preface this by saying that I don't think it fixes um, guys getting paid or not paid. I think that the NBA should open up and I, and I, it sounds like they're going to to allow. Uh, kids to go straight from high school to the NBA. Yeah. I don't think that fixes the issue at hand. Uh, I've seen a lot of people touting the, you know, players should be should have representation and, and be able to have aids and and facilitate deals uh, in college. And I, I think that's a decent idea to explore. Uh, but I'd be lying to you if I if I said I had a perfect way to fix all this because I think at the end of the day, Chris, if somebody wants to get ahead in a way that's not. Um, morally sound or, or would be looked at as unethical, it's always going to happen if there's a way. Yeah, yeah. Do you think there'll be major changes coming after this season or this school year? Uh, I mean, I think it's possible. I don't think that I would know. I mean, I, it's not something that I would be privy to know. But I think something's got to happen. I think yeah. the NCAA knows that something has to happen. And I, I think you know from – uh, your conversations in NBA circles, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the conversations I've had with uh, guys in the NBA is, is that sometime in the next couple of years that, that the, uh, the one and done rule is going to go away and they're going to in some capacity allow kids to go from high school to, to the NBA, whether they have to start in the G league or, or, or go a different route. But it, it sounds like the NBA is, is or at least Adam Silver is making a push towards that. Yeah, I think that's definitely coming, and I think they'll let kids play in the G League, um, which, you know, and I actually – I love Steve Kerr's idea that if a high school kid declares for the draft and doesn't get drafted, he should be able to still go to college and play, you know? Um, yeah, I agree. I agree with that too. Yeah. I, I, I definitely agree with that. And I think I think Adam Silver sees weakness in the NCAA right now. Yep. And I, I don't know what his exact plan in, in terms of – allowing kids to come straight from high school would be, but it's a great opportunity. And, and I've seen some models out there where maybe they would even, maybe they would sign an, a normal first round contract if they got drafted in the first round or whatever, but maybe they'd have to play their first year in the G league. And, and honestly, if, if these kids are making, I, I don't know what the first round money is, but let's hypothetically, they make $5 million the first time their first year out and they're spending it in the G league. I think a lot of them will do it and, and just think about the awareness and the brand recognition and the excitement that was, that's really got going around the NBA summer league as of late especially yep. last year yep. you know, with Lonzo ball and Jason Tatum. Well, if DeAndre Ayton and Marvin Bagley and Michael Porter are all playing in the G league, I think people would probably watch it. Yeah. That's a good point. I agree. I agree. So, Well, Evan, man, thanks a lot for your knowledge. You've been great. I'm about to go fill out my bracket, as I said, and uh, I'm looking forward to winning it this year. So thanks a lot, man. Good Good to have you on In The Zone. 
Well, good luck, man, and I appreciate you having me on, and uh, I respect your work. Keep it up, man. Thanks a lot, man. I'll see you.